back to another webinar on the fantastic topic of application security. <laughs> we haven't <laughs> talked enough about it. Uh, so we decided to do another one fully in depth on application security. Now, jokes aside, um, my name is Francesco Sicolo and I'm your host for today, but the star of the show is Josh Crossman, uh, a good friend, um, an OWAS contributor for several projects and a leader really in application security. He joins from Israel, from Bound Security, but I'll let Josh introduce yourself for the very few people that don't know you. Josh, my <laughs> Welcome. Thanks so much, Francesco. Thanks. Uh, great to see you. And uh, yeah, thank you very much to everyone for, for joining today. So uh, yeah, like Francesco says, I work as an application security consultant and CTO for Bounce Security. And you know, definitely my passion is application security. I don't think you can talk enough about application security. I think we can uh, talk lots and lots about it. I think that we're never going to run out of challenges there. Um, I'm not going to go through my whole bio. Um, I think you can see that, especially uh, from my, my other materials. But I guess the key things that uh, I think are important, especially for this conversation in my background, is that uh, I sort of come from a more general IT risk um, background and sort of gradually specialized in security and application security. Uh, I may have even uh, picked up an accountancy qualification a long, long time ago, sort of along the way. And, you know, that's, yeah, you know, it's given me a slightly wider view and sort of given me quite a good business focus as well. And thinking about, okay, we need to solve business problems. We need to be aligned with what the business problems that an organization is having. Um, I've also done some software development work in the past. I've also been involved with that. So, uh, that also gives me a, a perspective on what the average developer is looking at, how they feel, the sort of ways that they work. Um, and yeah, and so before I started working where I am today, I also worked in application penetration testing. So I very much see the, the security side as well. So I think you know, all these different aspects have sort of helped me in the place that I am today. And where I am today is you know, focusing on helping software developers, development organizations, development leaders figure out, okay, how are we going to build software in a secure way. You know, I don't want to be the person who just comes along and breaks things. I want to be the person who comes and helps organizations and helps developers and helps leaders think about, well, you know, how can we introduce security practices into our organization? Um, so yeah, that's sort of my day to day now working as a, a consultant, sort of as an AppSec architect or an AppSec engineer, or you know, just generally providing guidance on building security processes and improving security processes. Um, and a lot of that Brilliant. comes down to tooling. You know, certainly a lot of organizations that uh, you know, have various different application security tools involved. Um, so that is a, a large part of it as well. And um, you also contribute to several projects for OWASP. If you, if you can, can you give a little bit of a description for the few audience that don't know what OWASP is and what the contribution is and also how to get involved? And then we can dive deeper into the uh, conversation. Okay, so open, sorry, OWASP is the open worldwide application security project. It recently changed its name. Um, so I'm again confused trying to remember it, but it's the open worldwide application security project. The idea is it's a non profit organization with chapters around the world and lots and lots of different projects, all with the aim of providing guidance and providing assistance for, for building secure software and you know, helping organizations, helping individuals to learn more about how to do that in a, um, you know, in, in a, you know, reliable and I guess a way that complies with leading leading practices from today, but you know ideally either free or in a, in a, in a relatively cheap way. The idea is to make it as, as accessible as possible. Um, so I'm primarily involved. I'm a co-leader for the OWASP application security verification standard, which is a a great project that comes to try and bring uh, requirements for developers, requirements for software. You know how to make sure that the software is secure. You know, what what things to take into account when you're actually building it. Uh, I'm also on the OWASP chapter board in here in Israel. Uh, we've got our uh, AppSec IL conference coming up in a couple of months. So we're really excited about that. And certainly if you're interested in that, uh, look it up or look on my social media and there's all information there. Um, but yeah, the great thing about OWASP is that anyone can get involved. Anyone can find a way of being involved and find a way of supporting the organization, be that by getting involved in a local chapter. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds of chapters around the world that you can be involved in, or be that being involved in projects. Again, there are several hundred projects that you can be involved in, some higher profile, some lower profile, but you know, all of which are generally really happy to have people contributing and suggesting ideas and, and giving their help. So it's you know, certainly a great organization to be involved with and uh, you know, a great way of trying to improve the overall 
security posture in uh, in the industry. Yeah, and, and I think that's uh, one of our commitment with Phoenix to actually uh, give back to the community and in every episode or every talk and conversation is like spread the word for us and um, let them know, let people know that there are projects out there uh, that they can use and they're for free. Yeah. And <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted to introduce a topic for today. I think there have been a lot of discussion around tooling, a lot around um, what's out there and that has generated uh, a little bit of confusion of how the heck do i even start in application security application security mm -hmm. is it pen test is it like do i need to scan my code what do we do so we want to demystify a little bit with josh today on what tool do you need either open source or non-open source to actually start a project and then uh, the kind of key things is how to fine tune those tooling to actually get the result that you need because generating noise is pointless. Like automation is great, but a sea of noisy data is not really useful for anybody, both from a developer perspective and a security. And we're going to dive deeper in that conversation on the key challenge that each organization face around this evolution in application security that is... I think in the last two, three years, I don't know you, George, but I see an, an enormous acceleration positively in that subject, but also a mismatch of application security, container security, cloud security. As application security people, we are doing everything now and nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, certainly from my perspective, you know, the organizations that I see, I, you know, I think that the pattern that's emerged is if you went, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago and you said to organizations, do you have an application security program? They'd say, oh yeah, we, we do pen testing every year. That's our, that's our application security program. And certainly in the last <laughs> few years, you know, I think we, we, we've evolved. And now if you ask an organization, do you have an application security program? They'll be like, yeah, of course we've got an application security program. We've got SAS, we've got DAS, we've got SCA, we've got this tool, we've got that tool. Um, you know, organizations have sort of seen, okay, well, we need to put all these tools in place. We need to have these all these different capabilities. But I think they've they've put these tools in place, and I think they've sort of expected that they're suddenly going to become secure. That's magic. suddenly going to be the the end destination. Yeah, it's effectively saying, okay, we've got this magic wand. We're going to wave it, and suddenly we're going to have secure software. Um, whereas what we see in practice is that these tools do take some. Yeah, you know, they do have some subtlety about them. Um, you know, you have they have to put be put in in the right way. They have to be used in the right way. You know, implementing these tools is sort of a project and a process. It's not a it's not a one time thing. It's not a, a a one hit and then we're and then we're done. And what will happen is they won't necessarily take the time to implement them um, in a consistent way or in a way that best matches what they do. And they end up with millions and millions of findings and a huge backlog and you know, all these you know, numbers flying all over the place saying you've got this many criticals, you've got this many highs, and these numbers getting up to management and management saying, oh, why are we We've got this problem. We need to do better. Why isn't security fixing this for us? You know, why, why is, uh, you know, why, why, why is security not securing our software? And I think that's a, another aspect of this is that you know, it's seen as security's problem. It's seen as okay, well, AppSec needs to come along and fix this. AppSec needs to make our software secure. Um, and yeah, you know, I think I think ultimately it leads to a negative feeling about security because then AppSec try and solve the problem. They're going to development teams. They're saying, look, can you look into this? Can you look into that? But they don't necessarily know where to start. They maybe. In you know, worst case, they might just be providing them with a whole long list of vulnerabilities or potential vulnerabilities they need to deal with. And it can ultimately lead to a very sort of negative feeling about security. And it sort of comes back to that initial point. You know, if the AppSec program becomes these tools and everyone hates the AppSec program because everyone hates the tools because everyone hates getting all these findings. And it leads to this sort of very negative attitude to, towards security. I mean, certainly, certainly from my perspective, I, I've seen that over the last few years. And I, you know, to, the, to the extent I, I realized there was, you know, there was effectively a gap where people just weren't talking about this issue. They weren't talking about this problem of you know, how are we actually dealing with these tools? How are we going to actually get these good to grips with these tools? Everyone's talking about we can automate this. We can put this in the pipeline. We can put that in pipeline. We can create a long chain of tools. But no one's thinking about the actual organizational aspects of it. Um, you know, how do we build a process out of it? How do we check how we're doing? How do we measure how we're doing? Um, and you know, I think that's certainly you know, one of the, one of the key things we want to talk about today. And you know, that's something that I was so passionate about. I ended up creating a, a full two-day training course about this because I think that there is a gap here where people aren't talking about this sort of uh, um, aspect of these tools. You know, how do we actually integrate them? How do we actually use them effectively? No, and and that's great. I think one point that I would like to circle back on and highlight is the negative 
kind of attitude of uh, rolling in a lot of tool all of a sudden we get all this noise signal so if an organization wants to roll out a proper application security program it's not just about tooling it's about the methodologies about vulnerability management it's about how do we take this problem that comes out of the tool and and what do we do next and technology is not going to mm -hmm. save the world despite being a software company a technology company uh, I'm, I'm also a practitioner so I have to say technology will not save us all, but will help us no. accelerate in process and procedure and people um, that um, is probably the right attitude on using the tooling. Yeah. And finding uh, issues manually, aside from using the new AI trend and technology that we can see is not something that we can solve manually. So I think what I've seen in the past is a good and balanced way to use technology to identify at scale problem uh, fine-tuning those technology and then technology to actually help triage uh, scale fundamentally all that um, representation shipping through focusing on what's more important is really a powerhouse because enable us to focus security people on actually helping developer on achieving what they need to achieve faster it create that shared responsibility model that is very powerful in, a, in an upside program where security is not blamed for software issue and developer not blamed for software issue, but there is a collaboration between the two to actually solve at scale software issue that is really a business problem and introduce a business mm -hmm. risk. And when you talk about risk against risk, like do I go in production with bugs and issue or do I fix them now? It's really a decision that a product owner or a business owner can make. And I think that's a very healthy relationship that I see that works and when we flip the uh, the agenda on security please fix this or developer please fix this x number of vulnerability in x timeline that's when you start seeing friction have you seen have you seen in your experience this journey or is is this uncommon in your perspective i think there'll often be i think it sort of becomes led by the this idea okay well we need to secure things we need to fix these issues that have been identified we need to um you know we need to you know, commit to a particular time scales i think often the, the problem is that these time scales are decided within security i think that certainly you know security obviously, obviously have to be involved in that and they have to be providing that that sort of push but i think what often gets missed is that you know this needs to be you know, software security needs to be a function of software development. It needs to be part of the, of the software development process, which means that the you know the so engineering leadership needs to want to actually you know, take this responsibility and be you know accept this responsibility of maintaining security within within the product. And it means that they need to be they themselves need to take responsibility for actually you know taking this policy that's been defined, taking these timescales have been defined. And actually build, you know, building that into their processes and saying, look, we're going to comply with this. We're going to do the work that's needed in order to, to, you know, to actually comply with these requirements and to, you know, you know, basically meet these targets. But then, on the other hand, if you want that to happen, you also need to make sure that the targets you're setting make sense and the information you're providing makes sense. You know, it's all very well to say, okay, well, you won't have any criticals and highs in your product, and then. You know, let's say that you manage to get engineering management on board with that and they'll accept, yeah, okay, we agree. We don't want any criticals and highs in our products. And then the tool throws a bunch of criticals and highs at them. Half of them aren't actually, you know, relate to a library they don't actually have. Others relate to a library they do have, but isn't reachable or isn't used, or there's some reason why it's not really relevant. Others are false positive coming from some sort of code scanner that um, has misunderstood the code and they aren't real anyway. And yes, you know, so even if we've got those targets, we still need to have those other processes around making sure that the information that the targets are based on and the information that's used to check are we complying with the targets or not isn't itself accurate. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's a really important point that you're making because it's really easy to point scanner at everything that is in the pipeline, but actually which pipeline are, is deploying to production? How early do you want to identify issue or how do you want to triage an issue in development or in UAT? versus an issue in, uh, that is going to production. Do you want to deploy gate? All these kind of small decisions can lead to a number of friction points that technology can help 
not speeding up, but magnify, I guess, when you deploy at scale. And it it kind of removed the trust in both the security team and the tooling that you implement because all of a sudden you have noise and the team is inundated with critical and having SLA data flat or flat kind of measurement and metrics tend to create that friction. Um, so if we want to start um, from the very beginning, uh, and there is a lot of buzzword for DevSecOps or shift left, uh, shift right, uh, shift everywhere. <laughs> Let's start demystifying some of those terms into, okay, if I want to start my AppSec program, if we want to start um, getting those tools in, where do I get it in? And then what do I do with the output? What is a secure um, SDLC nowadays? Look, I think that you know there are, there are two parts to this. I think that you know the the AppSec program, the secure SDLC, there there are a lot of different things going on there, and it's not just about tools. I think there are lots of different activities that are going on there, lots of different things to think about. Um, and, you know, that that's almost you know a, a topic in itself. You know, that whole thing of of okay, well, how do we build this program in? How do we adopt this program? Yeah, there, I think there, there there are lots of considerations there. I think that it needs to be something where there's a a gradual approach that we say, okay, where do we want to start? What's most important to us? What do we want to start doing? And then again, how are we going to get that buy-in? How are we going to get that um, acceptance from the engineering organization where we actually want this to happen? Um, I think, you know, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to tools, I think the same sort of thing applies. You have to say, okay, well, what are we trying to achieve with this? What do we want to happen? And you know, who do we need to go to speak to about that? Um, so I think that, you know, certainly if we if we look at the at the sort of step by step of you know, how how we're going to do this what what's our what's our strategy i think the the first thing is to to actually have a plan in place you know what as security people do we want to do and that means okay well where do we want to start how are we going to prioritize like i said earlier if we're going to get buy in for this we need to make sure we have a really good plan to get bought in in the first place we don't want to get buy in for a plan that's not going to work well or is going to be too onerous on on the organization so I think certainly starting off by saying, okay, where do we want to start? Do I have, you know, maybe I'm in an organization with lots of different products, lots of different development teams. Maybe I want to start by thinking about which ones I'm the most concerned about, which ones are the most risky to the organization. I might also want to think about what risks are, are, are you know, a worse organization. What's the organization itself most worried about? What is the impact that's going to be most significant for that organization? And make sure that when I build my plan, I'm focusing on those sort of impacts. Uh, I might also want to think about you know, regulation or customer expectations. If I've, you know, if I, I've got regulation that requires me to address issues within a certain time, um, within a certain time, I need to make sure that I'm taking that into account when I'm actually building my plan. Um, and with all this in mind, I need to start thinking about well, how am I going to measure my progress? How am I going to make sure that I know how I'm doing? I know how that you know, these activities are performing correctly. And I know that the mm -hmm. output is being handled appropriately. Um, and that's going to come down to what measurements do I want to make? What measurements do I, do I want to track? You know, ideally, that shouldn't just be, okay, well, how many criticals do we have? How many highs do we have? Um, I think it needs to be a more, more than that. It needs to be thinking about, well, having a, a, a situation in place where we have a target. We know what we're striving for. And then we're comparing ourselves to that target. We're not just saying, well, we have 50 highs. We're saying we have... 50 highs, but we had planned to get our total count down to 60 in this period, and therefore actually we're doing better than we expected. Mm -hmm. It's about having an actual, um, you know, having an actual measurement in place. It's, we're not just comparing raw numbers, we're saying, well, what do these numbers mean? And it, you know, I think we may need to also to have some comparative numbers as well, numbers where we can say, well, this group is doing like this, and this group's doing that, you know, this group's got this um, score, this group's got that score, in order to provide some sort of overall view. But again, it's about making those numbers meaningful and making sure that we can measure both against our own targets and against the other parts of the organization as well. Yeah, we get some we got some love from all us on, on the channel from all us London <laughs> <laughs> on the community. Nice. Is a community is nice and neat together. Um I, I really like and, and thank you everybody for listening in. Uh, um uh, please feed up the comment. We'll try to we we'll try to uh, insert the comment during the conversation. I think you touch on two really important points there, Josh. Uh, is 
focusing on, 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 first of all, having a plan. And then the second part is having a narrative and a narrative that you can compare around the organization. Um, it's all good to have data, but data without, that is not insight, it's just noise. Um, 50 million vulnerability in an unused repository that is not deployed in production. Yes, it's a scary number, but do we need to care about it instead? One vulnerability on an API that is deployed externally um, that maybe has a remote code execution, that's much, much scarier um, than another one. So I think you mm -hmm. introduce also an important topic that is is risk and is is um, all these elements actually form what we call risk because when we talk about critical vulnerability, those are generic vulnerability that speed out of tool that don't have any concept of context. I go very slowly with that sentence because it's super complicated <laughs> to pronounce. <laughs> yeah. And I always switch them out. Um, but not having those contextual elements, both as you rightfully said, from a code perspective, are we using this library? Are we not using this library, this function? Um, versus the, the overall organizational context. What is the business criticality of this bunch of repos that are built in this application? Or is this application externally facing, internally facing? Even consideration like this enable to say, okay, this set of vulnerability will park because they're not important and we focus on the set of vulnerability that's going to hit us in the face tomorrow for reason that we well uh, are aware. Um, why is it usually so complicated to start talking about this topic of context and if you want smart upsec versus please fix everything in x amount of days why do we as a security industry we go back to fix all the vulnerability all together at the same time yeah i think that you know, I think there's a, there's a challenge here of actually getting that information and having that information. And I think that you know, maybe that the tools that you're using can provide some of that context. You know, for just as an example, there are certain um, software composition analysis SCA tools that will provide a slightly more refined score, slightly more refined um, CVSS score, because they've done some more research on the vulnerability. And they can therefore provide, provide a more accurate measurement. Okay, well, how risky actually is this vulnerability? Um, but not, no, not everyone offers that, but that's you know, one possibility. You might have that. That's just one example of many, many things you need to take into account. Ultimately, you're very much exposed to, um, firstly, what your tool is capable of doing. And secondly, any other processes that you've put in place around those results. It may be that once you've got those results, you've taken the information you've got from the tool, and you've then applied your own sort of triage process of saying, okay, well, this vulnerability is in this this uh, project, which is lower priority from my perspective. This vulnerability is of this type, which is lower priority from my perspective. Or the opposite, you know, this is our, in our critical repository, and therefore we need to get to it ASAP. Or this this impact in a critical way to our business, and therefore we need to you know run and look at that first. But if you haven't thought ahead and actually put those processes and put those plans in place, then you're not going to be ready to do that when you suddenly get you know a thousand vulnerabilities spat out by this tool and i think that um you can again the tool will provide some of that information but if you haven't had that process of saying well what are we going to do with the output when we get the output from this tool then you're not going to be ready to actually carry out that sort of triage or that sort of um prioritization when it comes down to it um and ultimately you know, I'm talking about, I'm saying you, who, you know, who, who's you in this case? I guess you as the organization, but again, maybe you as a security person know how to do this or are able to do this, but it may be that you don't scale. You know, maybe there's one of you and 40 development teams and you need to be in a particular situation where all the other um, teams, you know, you know, all these development teams can actually do part of this themselves because otherwise no one, you know, you're not going to get through all of this. You're not going to be able to cover all of this. And that means that this process that I'm talking about, this process of saying, we're going to take the results and we're going to prioritize them in some way it has to be usable and I guess executable by these teams themselves, not just by the security expert. And that sort of brings us into the, the next stage. Once we've got that overall plan, once we know what we want to do is that sort of buy-in stage. Actually the stage mm -hmm. of saying, look, we're, the security expert isn't going to do that alone. They're going to have to get buy-in from the engineering organizations in, actual, in, in order for that to actually happen at scale. No, I think that's, so the collaboration and, and the engineering buying, I think is, is super important. And 
the triage aspect is probably this, the aspect that generally speaking as upsec we we miss or in general vulnerability management people or, or anybody that fundamentally take a problem and, and they need to analyze what to do with it and sometimes that problem is um overlooked because triaging is a very very complex process that requires looking at a lot of data points as you rightfully said you know the business data mm -hmm. point the organizational data point even if the team has time to fix things uh right now and there is the shift left mentality that has kind of sold the dream that you can solve everything at the very beginning and everything is solvable at a specific point but without a business buy-in uh like our, our friend tanya always says it's pointless because if developers don't have the commitment from the organization and the time to actually go and fix stuff it's all well and done to say okay please fix this at the very beginning but if they don't have the right ID integration, if they don't have the right feedback at the right time, um, that is not mm -hmm. as, uh, an insane amount of, of critical vulnerability every time they click merge, um, is I think it's complex to actually push these ideas without a plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I this, wanted, this is a massive part of it. Mm -hmm. I, I want to also go back maybe, um, like we use a representation of, um, what it is an SDLC uh, overall. Let me see if I can share my screen without killing everything. <laughs> All right, are you able to see the screen? Yeah. All right, brilliant. So I wanted to maybe take this as a reference point on the complexity of what it is to actually deploy an SDLC in a pipeline and underneath kind of the two stages of triage. I think there are two stages of triage that generally speaking kicks in. That is when do you want to fix something immediately and when the tool actually give you feedback. And there are certain elements that actually are very beneficial from triage this triaging process uh, versus when things get detected in operation and things get detected offline because not all the time something can get detected uh, at code level or while you're writing a piece of string or a piece of code sometimes requires a bigger analysis or library becomes vulnerable. So I think there are these two stages of triage that people overlook and say, well, the tool just run. And on the other aspect, and that's your, your bigger area probably, is how do you fine tune these tools and what are the different mode of operation that those tools kind of kick in in an SDLC process? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, this this sort of diagram is is, is very scary and <laughs> <laughs> this is much too complete I, I, when you have all the process and all the tool implemented at the various stages. Um, yeah, you can start I, in step, and that's what we're going to cover maybe with the vulnerability management framework. I like this as a yeah. blueprint. Yeah, it's it's kind of a blueprint. It's kind of scary. I mean, it's it's almost just like here are some ideas, but we want to go. We want to look in this diagram and say, okay, well, which one of these ideas are we going to take and we're going to make work? Because I think that's the biggest thing: actually making this sort of thing work, making it actually um, operate in an effective way, such that it just kind of carries on and it's sustainable and it happens and the process works and we're not constantly on fire about it. Um, and I don't think it's going to take you, let's say it's going to take you a little bit of time to get to a situation where you're doing every single <laughs> item here. Um, just a little bit. A little time. bit. Um, <laughs> and, and because of that, I think, you know, I th and that's one of the reasons I find this diagram a little bit challenging because it's, it's not even like an end goal. I, I think you, people say, okay, when are we going to get here? When, when are we going to get here? When are we going to get to this situation? And I think in some ways, to me, the, the, the first like big end goal is to be in a situation where you've got a good way of getting one of these items rolled out well, and then, then the next item rolled out well, and then the next item rolled mm -hmm. out well. But that that rolling out process, that implementation process is smooth and it works, it's proven. And you can know, okay, we know how we're gonna do this. We know what we need from the organization. We know that how we need to identify who's gonna be involved with it. We know we have the skills to actually configure the tool in a way that it's actually going to work and actually gonna provide sort of useful insights. I think that that's the, to me, that's the, the real, 
I, that's, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the biggest goal of SSDLC to me. It's the biggest, you know, that's what we want to get to. We want to get to a situation where we can roll this sort of thing out in a, in a straightforward way. You know, the goal of SSDLC isn't to do every single item on this diagram. It's to be in a situation where we know that we can confidently roll out this item and then this item, this item mm -hmm. over a period of time. It's going to take time, but to be able to do that in an effective way. Um, and yeah, I, think, I think that comes back to the buy-in point as well, because it's saying, well, you know, security are not going to do all of this. Security are going to provide a lot of guidance with this and prevent, potentially you know, provide, you know, hold people's hands in the first steps of it to actually get them used to it. But a lot of this is going to fall onto the development organization itself or to the surrounding operations and infrastructure, depending on the, the type of organization. Um, yeah, it's going to fall on those teams primarily with security providing sort of expertise and consulting along the way. Um, right. Yeah, and, that's, and that's, you know, that's something I'm trying to push at the moment. I mean, if we think about, you know, I'm always thinking specifically about AppSec, but you know, if we think about security as an aspect of software quality, then mm -hmm. you, know, you wouldn't have a, you, know, you, you wouldn't say, okay, well, we're going to have this completely separate, um, unconnected set of people who are responsible for um, you know, different aspects of software quality. Software, you know, most things are, in software quality are considered part of the software process. You know, user experience, performance, um, you know, you know, other items that come up when you're trying to build a piece of software, you know, they're all considered part of the quality of software. You're not going to release a piece of software that's really slow. You're not going to release a piece of software where the person's using it, they can't figure out, okay, well, how do I get from this button to that button? Like, why don't I understand the flow? It's, I think security has to become the same thing, and we have to have that built into the process as well and built into that mindset of okay security is just another part of software quality another part of another thing that the development organization need to have built into their processes um and then the other part of that of being able to make sure that it happens effectively and that the the the, the, the activity is actually operating effectively is having these metrics like we said having these measurements be able to say well how do we know that this is mm -hmm. operating effectively how are we tracking the output of this activity um, and making sure that someone's actually, you know, keeping an eye on that and is, is, is collecting that information. If you've got, if you're a security person, you've got 20 different teams, part of knowing that you can roll out one of these items on this diagram in an effective way is knowing that you're going to have a way of knowing that it's actually happening. You can tell that they are doing, um, you know, that this, these scans have actually happened. You can tell they've actually reviewed the output of the scan. You can tell they've carried out a, um, secure requirements process. You can tell that they've performed threat modeling. You don't have to go to every single one and say, have you done this? Have you done this? And you go to each one individually. You've got a way of doing it. Um, you know, I'm working with an organization on something very similar at the moment. And we're talking about the, the RACI matrix, the responsible, accountable, consulted, mm -hmm. and informed you know, idea. Who's, who's going to do these different jobs? And I've added on to that M for monitoring. Because I said, look, for every single activity we've got, someone needs to be actively responsible for monitoring this is happening and providing the metrics so that we can see this is actually going on. And so we've got evidence that, that things are actually happening, that we can keep it, you know, we can see when teams are struggling or when they're not managing to, to, to carry that out. And obviously you know, in an, as automated way as possible and in a way that you know, doesn't require all sorts of you know, manual updates or whatever else, but it has to be an inter, inter, integral part of it. Because ultimately, like I say, we want to be in a situation where we can take one of these activities and make it work and be confident it's going to work. And part of that is the buy and part of that is actually going to monitor that it's actually happening. No, I think measurement is probably the key things um, around if these are happening at all into more processes, either manual or automated, ideally just in larger scale organization or medium scale organization, you want part of it or all of it completely automated, um, but also the match is going to tie it in to what you're going to fix because then it can tell a story and a narrative like, okay, we're increasing the number of issues because maybe there are too many stories. And um, I have a question from, uh, from Sam. Yeah. How do you deal with developers viewing security scan tool as a blocker? So I think the first thing I'd say is that unless you're really sure that what you're blocking with is you know drop everything critical you know get in the way of the developer level of critical you probably don't necessarily want to be block blocking in the first place you may want to have that as a as a separate process you know i certainly not you know i, I talked about okay well how are we going to put in this tool to begin with and you're certainly not, not going to start with okay well we've put in this tool we switched it on and now it breaks the pipeline every time someone runs it if there's a vulnerability yeah, that's that's a great way to to get security very sort of <laughs> Un unhappy developers and uh, people not liking security. Um, 
so I think there has to be that sort of gradual process where you start off by saying, look, we're not going to break immediately, but then we have to have some sort of side process that, uh, you know, that enforces the particular policy we need. Maybe we don't want um, critical vulnerabilities getting into production, for example, but we don't block the build, but we have some sort of process further down the line where we don't release until that gets addressed or there's some sort of, you know, mm -hmm. some sort of other policy. Um, so I think that that's part of it. I think part of it is also taking a gradual approach and saying, look, we want to go step by step. We're going to start off with a certain, trying to solve a certain set of problems or use a certain set of rules um, you know, for SAS. We're going to search for a certain set of things, make sure that those, that those uh, rules are operating well and not bringing lots of noise, get them tuned, out, um, tuned up. And then we're in a situation where we know, okay, well, it's not giving us much noise anymore. Maybe we're now, once we've spent some time with that rule and spent some time tuning it down, maybe now we're in a situation where we say, okay, you know what? This is almost certainly going to be a, a real issue if it pops up. And then maybe we can, um, you know, maybe maybe we, we're, we're confident enough that maybe we can break that process because we feel confident enough that the developer also has the knowledge and the ability to actually make that fix themselves. It's not a question, okay, my build's broken. I now need to go and, I don't know, find someone from security and ask them what this is and spend ages finding a, a solution. I think that's the other part of it as well. Being able to say, well, okay, we broke the build because we are pretty confident this is a high fidelity issue. This is a you know, mm -hmm. high signal issue that we think is really an issue. But we want, to have we want to have put something in place up front that makes it easy for the developer to find how, how do you fix that. You know, I talk about this in the course as well. I talk about, well, you know, your tool might give you a certain amount of information about the, about the finding. If you've got a lot of these findings coming up, maybe create some in-house information to go with that. Okay, this is cross-site scripting. Well, in theory, the tool's going to say, well, in theory, you need to do output encoding somehow, depending on the context being on this. But maybe you can add your own guidance saying, look, in this product, in this module, if you'll get this rule popping up saying you've got a problem, you need to use this library specifically to fix it. You mm -hmm. need to use this internally developed solution. And then it becomes a question, well, maybe the scan broke, but it's a simple, oh, I need to use that. Fine, I'm going to go and use that. I'm going to put that in, and now it's going to pass. Um, so in summary, I think you, don't want to break it you don't want to break it immediately, but if you are going to break it, make sure that the, 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 um, it's a, you know, a definite issue and that you've given them a good solution up front. Yeah, no, I think that's important, but that requires, of course, the ability for security to you know, not deal with the output of all of this that is usually a nightmare and developer as well. So good culture and having the buy-in from the business and time between security and development to actually discuss this really important topic that can be super laser point effective rather than just fixing things based on an SLA, based on, on, on individual issues. And that's why I really like this view because it, it helps kind of contextualizing, well, at scale, this is complex. You can start small, but very soon becomes overwhelming for both security professional and developer. And it's, it's not just, just fix it or, or just upgrade it or just fix a vulnerability. Sometimes there is a lot of element that happens in triage and fixing it. And, and I used to use this one that is um probably the just fix it is actually the ripple effect is that can't happen anything that you can break other pieces of code like okay you remove a function or you upgrade a major framework but then there are ripple effect on that and maybe there are other people depending on that api so some element can be fixed which is one line of code but uh, also the consideration that certain fixes can take an enormous amount of time not all of them uh, but some might take ripple effect, and this is this is an extreme case where you know you have an incident, you have an issue, it has other ripple effects, so it's a chain of effect when just patching it. But these things happen in, in reality. When um, I, I like to use this to actually say fixing is not as straightforward as possible. Uh, as always, you need to take time to consider those things. And you need to free yeah. up time. Like other stuff can be fixed immediately in IDE. So having that feedback immediately available is really important. But also having that understanding that each sprint, you might need to dedicate one, two, five story point on security issue to actually eat up that backlog of issues or collaborate or discuss a specific security issue. So there needs to be a buy-in from a business perspective on actually dedicating time on actually fixing those things. How do you deal with those yeah. conversations? Like when the business say, oh, well, we just want to 
orchestrate and just deploy an upside program that fix all of our issues. How do you deal with that conversation? I think this comes comes down to saying, you know, what what is an AppSec program? What is the goal, and you know, how, how do we think this is going to happen? You know, I think there's, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of talk about, oh, we just need to automate everything, and we just need to make everything you know super easy and super accessible. And I, th I think one thing that people f forget about that is, you know, when I don't know when Netflix talk about paved road or something, or when you know, when a big organization talks about how they, um. You know, it's made everything really easy for developers, made everything self-service for developers. You know, how many security-focused developers or security engineers who know how to write code did it take to get to that stage? You know, if you've got a giant team of security people and you've got a giant team of uh, developers, your only job is to write scripts and code and support modules and whatever else for the security team, then it's easy to say, well, we'll just automate everything and make everything very easy. But if that's not the case, then we have to start thinking, well, you know, this is going to we're going to try and automate certain things but there's going to be manual work there as well and you know, i think it comes back to that point about security being an aspect of quality and that aspect of buy-in it means that we'll, you know, we have to be sure that what we're bringing is definitely the most effective way of doing this and the most gradual way of doing this and i think that you know I, as, a, as a as a i guess i consider myself a security person you know i get i, I get a little bit nervous or uncomfortable you know, by saying okay well let's just activate three SAS rules. Okay, let's start off with three SAS rules out of the 50 and get mm -hmm. them working really well. And I'm just sort of got this uncomfortable feeling in my stomach saying, well, oh, like, what about the other 47? What am I missing? What's, you know, what's, what's not, what's not going to work here? What am I not going to find? But if I'm in a situation where I need to start with three and then gradually build it up, you know, I need to have that position in place. But if I can demonstrate that I can put this sort of thing in gradually and make it accessible gradually and get developers using it gradually so that they can actually take it on and it's not a huge burden, I think in the long run, it's going to work more effectively than saying, well, here are 50 SAS rules, here are 40,000 findings that came out of that, um, now what? <laughs> um, and, it, and it's difficult, but I think that you know, there, there is a reality here that it's going to, it takes time to implement this sort of thing and to actually get this sort of thing r rolling. We have to see this as a process. And you know, like I say, you think, okay, well, I bought the tool, I paid the license fee, um, and I should be secure. That's just, it's just not how it works. And I think that... Um, yeah, and it comes back to this you know, this diagram and the idea of saying you know, how, how can we demonstrate that we can roll things out effectively and we can make it work. And I think once we demonstrate we can do this in an incremental way, in a way that doesn't create a huge burden and in a way that's collaborative, I think it's, it's a lot gets a lot easier to get the development team on board with that to realize okay, well they're not suddenly going to have this massive, huge responsibility, huge effort they have to do all at once that's not really in their comfort zone, but it's going to be a gradual thing. They're going to get support and. You know, they're going to feel comfortable that, okay, we can do this. We can get this as part of our day to day. I think the more that happens, the more comfortable the organization, the developers are going to feel with security in the first place and the easier it will get. No, that's brilliant. And I think I like the approach, the gradual approach of actually not turning everything on because together with a little bit more contextual aspect, um, and that's why I split between software and application context and environment context. That helps not overwhelming everybody. And then you get into a maturity stage that is higher and higher. And actually, on that aspect, I wanted to pick up the maturity model that we put out together because it was a good way to say you don't need to be at that super high level from day one with everything implemented from scratch because that's unrealistic. Um, and it also, I also like to bring always back to, I think a statement that Google always makes, it is, okay, we wanted to be able to combat na national state attackers. And hence we deploy a small, uh, a small national state <laughs> budget for security. So sometimes <laughs> it's all about against whom you want to defend and are you Google? <laughs> <laughs> or are you Facebook, are you Netflix, or actually Meta now, uh, or Netflix and so on. So not everybody can afford to have like a huge platoon of security engineers that works in there and create kind of those security default, security paved way. It's the dream to actually have everything automated. But sometimes, you know, doing security is actually better than not doing anything because you want to build this perfect state. And this is kind of the mm. philosophy that we wanted to bring in with this project that is part of OWASP and yeah. you know, it's an open source project. So if you want to contribute, there's a link in the comment to actually come and contribute. 
So what, um, why, why to add to why to add just a final point because I think that it sort of brings an interesting point as well. A sort of interesting closure on the idea about well, you know, are we Netflix? Are we not Netflix? You know, but how um, you know, how much can we really do on, uh, in that situation? I think that once we're in a situation where okay, there aren't many security people, so we're going to have to try and get the developers doing certain parts of this. We're going to get them handling tasks related to these security activities. We're going to get them rolling these tools, uh, looking through the results of these tools. The more that we can sort of make as part of the developer's day-to-day -day and make it easy for the part of their day-to-day, -day, the less that falls back on security and the more time that security have to actually think mm -hmm. about these more advanced activities, these more advanced ideas, these other ways of making things easier for the developers and, and you know, creating some aspect of that paved road. But in order to do that, then you know, developer needs to be, the developer teams need to be handling a lot of the what would be considered basics, but clearly everyone struggles with. Yeah, and, and it all comes back at, uh, to, to, to the concept of time, like how much time do you want to dedicate to each specific function? And that gets back to the buy-in of the business. That's why I really like the risk approach because enable developer team and product team to actually either highlight the impact that specific set of vulnerability called to, to the organization and to that specific product, if their business critical, if they're exposed externally, the risk level of those product and those vulnerability are really high and critical. And I think Sam put together uh, a really good comments uh, uh, on, on that line on, okay, yes, you actually deprioritize certain other issue. And then what happens somebody hits that um, specific issue, that specific key or that key get published. Yeah. Yeah. I'm What's your thought on that? Like priority versus like, okay, you deprioritize certain things and then you have security issue that might be there. Yeah. And I think it comes to a question of you know, this sort of triage proce process, this sort of contextual risk has a number of different factors. You know, it may be that, okay, in general, we were more concerned about the production repositories. We're more concerned about the ones that are directly exposed. But maybe we're also concerned about specific issue types, regardless of where they're found. Mm -hmm. It may be that secret, hard-coded secrets are a problem everywhere, and we don't necessarily differentiate for that perspective. So it may be, again, it's going to be this contextual aspect of, you know, what type of issue is this? Where is this issue located? And there's you know, going to be a blend of that and other things we're going to need to take into account when we think about, okay, well, what do we want to tackle first? What do we want to address? Um, so I think that, that's the key thing, that there's not just one measure that we can use to say, okay, well, this is important, this is not important. And, you know, we, mm -hmm. we're starting off with that measure of, well, what's the severity of this finding? And then we're moving on to use other information we have to try and provide, give ourselves a better idea, okay, well, how do we want to prioritize that? When do we want to take that out? No, I, I, do, I do agree on that. And it's an incremental approach. And there isn't one solution that fits all, ultimately. Um, yeah, this, I is, guess. this is the problem. I think this, this is sort of why I, this is it why depends. I ended up building a training course. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's why I ended up building a training course. And, you know, I, I sort of got to, I realized that I can't, I can't write a resource. I can't create a resource that will, you know, do this for people. I can't make a, a make a way of just making this work for people, but I can give them the knowledge. I can give them the background. I can give them the context to sort of have these discussions in their own organization and come up with their own process that works for their organization their organization situation and you know, that's mm -hmm. very much the goal i wanted to get to giving them this background knowledge because you know certainly you know there's a lot of, you know if you want to know technically how to use a tool there's loads and loads of documentation of like how you put the tool in this right. pipeline or how you run this or how you get this information but again the people and process aspects are just not not being talked about not being covered um what do i do after that and that's you know that's the, the gap i wanted to try and fill there and i think you know the, the gap that exists and Certainly, contextual risk is one part of that. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And that's why risk is probably a good discussion topic between the business and the level of tolerance that somebody wants to go for and go for it. Um, just vulnerability, you know, vulnerability or a specific set of issue can be anywhere. If you raise that as a specific risk, they can have all that context of, okay, this is the probability of this event to happen is very, very high. Hence, we're not going to tolerate that in any um, 
in any kind of organization and in any kind of environment, and maybe, I don't know, SQL injection is not going to be applicable for my specific application, so I'll raise a false positive. All of these process and procedures goes around um, the triaging process, and that's actually the heart of the triaging process that that is the complicated aspect of it. Uh, but, and, and as you rightfully say, there is no one solution that fits all. It's all about the risk tolerance of each organization and the maturity level of each organization and where they are in maybe this diagram, SAM, OWASP, SAM, that is the wider application security framework or DSOM. Um, those are the framework of reference from an OWASP perspective that you can look at if you want to assess from a maturity level where you are. But as we're coming close to the time, I I would like to, like we mentioned a couple of times, your training. Uh, what, what's your training about, by the way, on, on, on recent things? Where can people uh, learn more on, on how to do those things at scale? Maybe not with just technology like ours, but actually process and procedure, how they talk to the business and how they tweak their tooling. Um, yeah, so the, the course is called uh, Building a, a High Value AppSec Scanning Program. Um, and it's, it's, it's all focused on the tool specifically because that's where I see the, the, the main pain at the moment. Um, and I've already delivered it, I think, three times now through OS conferences, one virtually and twice in person, once in San Francisco, once in Dublin. Um, and yeah, it really tries to give you ideas about okay, well, how you know, understanding these tools better, how can we build processes around these tools? How can we more effectively go through the findings from the tools? Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think, you know, it's not about, okay, well, here's the technical code that we're going to use. Here's the script we're going to use to run it. It's, it's, it's not about that. There's plenty of courses that already exist about, you know, automated DevSecOps or whatever else, but that's not what this course is about. This course is about, okay, well, how do I actually use it? How do I actually have these conversations in my organization about building this into our processes? How do I do this in a way that's not going to make everyone hate me and hate security? Um, <laughs> and yeah, from that perspective, I think it focuses on sort of security people who are struggling with these sort of tools, or, or also, but also developers who are encountering them and uh, you know looking for to understand them better in order to work with them better. Um, so, and one of the interesting parts of the course is that you know again, because it's not designed to be hands-on write the script, the exercises are slightly different. The exercises usually come down to discussions and group work where you know, the participants use what they've covered in the lectures and actually talk through. Okay, well, how would we handle this in, in a simulated organization? You know, I do this privately, I do this publicly. For private organizations, we can focus specifically on, on their own organization. For public courses, where mm -hmm. it's people from all sorts of different organizations, I've got a simulated case study that I use where people can think about, well, how would I build it into the simulated organization? How would I handle this aspect? How would I, um, who would take responsibility for different parts of it? And you know, through those discussions, I think, it helps them really bring out the points that were covered in the, the lectures themselves. Um, we also look at the findings as well. We do some practice with actually um, how can we look at a set of findings and what's important. Yeah, exactly. What's what's important here? Where would I want to start? What's more concerning to me? What's less concerning to me? To, again, get that. It's partially about having some real experience of doing it and partially about having those discussions with a group of other people who are in a similar situation and you also have their own perspectives and own experience. Um, mm -hmm. So it's yeah, been really fantastic at the OWASP conferences, and I've got uh, the next run of it coming up at Black Hat USA in Las Vegas. Um, and I've got a little All bit right. more time there. It's uh, two days, but two longer days, so I'm going to have some extra content as well, um, including uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about aggregation as well, because that's something that uh, isn't really covered in the the OWASP version of the talk of the course, but uh, it's certainly been talked about a lot, and uh, sort of a lot of questions coming up around that. So I'll have some extra content around that, looking at well. You know, how can we do our aggregation? What benefits does that give us? What drawbacks does that uh, lead to? But uh, yeah, overall, I think it's going to be a really valuable course for people who are struggling with these, struggling with these sort of problems. Okay, I've got all these tools, but you know, how do I really make what them work effectively? Next? And how do I, you know, ultimately, I, I, I know, I've seen organisations where their security team's full time job is just trying to deal with these tools and deal with the output from these tools. And I want to get people to a situation where it's just sort of running. It just sort of works, and the processes are in place, and they've distributed it among the teams, and they can now start thinking about what's next. What other security mm -hmm. processes do I want to put into place? Brilliant. As we're coming close to the time, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's talk. Um, I want to open the floor to Q and A. Um, aside from, we try to cover a little bit of the question, um, as there is a lot of content that we covered today. Um, in the meantime, the question rolls out. Uh, if anybody, aside from LinkedIn, that we 
uh, linked you up. Uh, Josh, where can other people find you? Um, yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I'm also on uh, Mastodon and Internet, um, at uh, infosec.exchange. Um, I'll put my uh, my links into the comments in a sec. Um, but yeah, so uh, certainly I'm always happy and excited to talk about these sort of topics. It's something that I'm quite passionate about. I think that uh, you know the, the specific questions about how can we make these tools work better for us, and the more general question about how can we roll out an AppSec program in general that is going to work more effectively and is actually going to get adopted and actually going to be sustainable. Um, I'm always really interested to talk about that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me if you're interested. Brilliant. Uh, I don't think we have any question or, or we have time for any other question. Everyone, thank you so much for joining the talk. Uh, Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show and and the webinar. Um, I'm still in the podcast mentality, so I'm always going to call this a show. <laughs> I think I've done three or four times. Um, any, <laughs> any final thoughts um, to leave the audience with? Um. Yeah, I think that you know, the, the, the key thing here is going to be about having a plan of you know, how am I going to make this work effectively, getting that business buy-in, getting that acceptance that this isn't just a security problem, this is an organizational problem, this is a you know, security something the organization and the engineering, engineering organization is going to have to handle as a whole, and you're getting them bought into it and getting them involved in it, making sure that you're, you're spreading that load around. Um, do things incrementally, sort of take a slowly, slowly approach to gradually ramp up what you're doing, and have this attitude of sort of okay we're doing things slowly but we're constantly improving we're constantly adding new activities but in a way that works and i think that by sort of taking this gradual approach taking this you know slowly slowly approach i think it's going to make it a lot easier to get that buy-in it's going to be a lot easier mm -hmm. to get people actually engaged and involved in the security program and hopefully lead to an overall improvement in the security of the organization brilliant thank you so much for the final thoughts and everybody um link in the comments and uh, link on the show. Uh, go and participate if you're part of US um, or Black Hat US to Josh uh, webinar registration already open. And everybody, thank you for coming. If you need help, as always, we're here. Happy to support you with your triage and vulnerability management process. That's what we are, but we're here to actually share also knowledge in this fantastic webinar with AppSec Expert. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Have a lovely one. Thanks, Francesco. That was great. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye.